You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, and author of a new book called Auction Ready, How to Buy Property at Auction Even Though You're Scared Shitless. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner and mortgage broker. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the web website as well as download our free full or forecaster report which experts can you trust to get it right the elephant in the room.com.au please stick around for this week's elephant rider boot camp and we have a cracking dumb of the week coming up before we get started everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. Regular listeners will know that Chris and I are not fans of buying brand new apartments, townhouses or houses. It's all about risk and one of the areas of greatest risk is the big unknown of build quality. Over the last 10 months or so, as if to prove our point, the newspapers have been full of headlines about collapsing apartment buildings and consumer confidence in the sector has waned. But the thing is, we need new development and construction. We need the housing. We need it for the economy. So what makes a good development? How can a site be transformed into a place where people want to live, where a community evolves, where sustainable value is created? How can the emphasis be taken away from the building investor stock and maximising ROI and turn towards giving Aussies an opportunity to own their own home? Where are the industry players who care about the long term and are prepared to stand for something other than a quick buck? In this episode, we pick the brains of Chris Daff, Managing Director of Make Ventures, a Melbourne-based boutique development and investment company that specialises in mixed-use developments in urban infill sites. Chris is also MD of Assemble, creators of the Assemble model, which is a new pathway to home ownership, bridging the gap between renting and owning your home. Thanks for joining us, Chris. This should be a very interesting chat. Thanks for having me. Looking Hi, forward Chris. to it. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for being here, mate. I, um, yeah, I guess before we kind of get... I guess into what you're actually doing and your work. Give us a bit of an, exam- uh, an understanding of kind of your experience around development, how you got into it, and how long you've been doing it. Sure, sure. Um, well, by training, I'm a civil engineer and a geologist. Mm-hmm. So, um, geology was sort of more about the field trips than anything at university, to be honest. That was a bit <laughs> of fun at the time, but uh, I was never much good at the, uh, the theory. Um, and out of civil engineering, I ended up getting into a project management role in Docklands at the Docklands Authority. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a young guy at the time, it was a long time ago now, mm-hmm. um, it was a really good introduction to the development industry because as a young project manager working for a government authority, um, it's a bit like Utopia but not sort of quite that, that, that <laughs> bad. But, um, in some ways, but we were doing some pretty cool projects and I got to sit across the table from, you know, the sort of developers, you know, nationally at that point, Len Lease, Mervac, Mab, sort of all the big guys. So that was a really Harry. good exposure. Pardon? Harry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're... Um, and uh, so I went through that process and got to know a few people there and um, ended up getting myself involved in a business called Evolve Development. And we were doing um, quite a lot of apartments. And that was a business with Ashley Williams and Ron Walker. Um, our biggest year was probably 2013. We completed 600 dwellings in that year apartments. And we we're probably doing four or 500 blocks of land a year in the greenfield areas. So mm-hmm. it was a pretty diverse business, all in all in sort of residential formats, blocks of land or, or units. Um, mm-hmm. And all the apartments were, were done in an off the plan model. So And then, you know, out the back of that, I decided to go out and pursue some other areas of interest in real estate um, that were maybe a little bit less of a focus for Evolve moving forward um, and established make. And then now, obviously, we've got the Assemble business and um, the Assemble housing business is about um, delivering development models where we've got a much stronger alignment with our residents. Mm-hmm. So, and what does that sort of mean? That just sounds nice, doesn't it? But <laughs> that means that... Um, it means that um, we don't expose our residents to a lot of the risks, like you said in your sort of mm. introduction, mm. that they might see in other um, housing models that are available to them, which is like off the plan, right? And off the plan's been pretty good at supplying 
housing for this country, you know, yeah. for you know a long period of time now. And I think generally it's done a, done a pretty good job. There's been people that have been potentially a little bit disappointed with the outcome they got, and then there's been some stuff that's been a bit disastrous. But saying the the sort of industry be broken, I'm not suggesting you were saying this, but um, I think on the whole it's a pretty good system, but it's definitely got its challenges and. For, you know, Australians that are looking to enter the property market in an ownership sense, mm. um, to go and basically sight unseen, make the biggest financial commitment you'll probably ever make in your lifetime mm. yeah. is pretty odd. So in a yeah. lot of ways, so you're sort of saying, odd well... Odd but common. It's, well, it's really common, <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, and for a... You know, particularly for, I guess, you know, younger people trying to get into housing, you know, that might be, you know, the best option that's available for them yeah. in the market. You know, it has been in the past. There's other options emerging now where you say, well, because they sort of, we talk to a lot of young Australians in particular about how they feel about housing and they, some of the stuff that we hear is they feel like the housing market's not designed for them. So they sort of start to talk about things like saying, well, you know, I went to an auction for a one bedroom apartment in Richmond and... I went head to head with two, you know, sophisticated real estate investors that are sort of acquiring their seventh sort of investment property, mm -hmm. and I just sort of got blown out of the water at this auction, and you know that was pretty hard to take, to be honest, because I've been doing a good job yeah. saving up towards my deposit and yeah. everything. So um, anyway, so we we sort of hear a bit of that, but I've sort of got a bit off the track. So yeah, so we can talk about off the plan, I guess, yeah. in more detail. So, but I mean, so. So Evolve was all off the plan, right? Mm. We did some really good projects and won some awards for those projects. And, you know, I, th I think generally people would be pretty happy with the products that we delivered for them, the housing that we delivered for them. One of the weird things about traditional development models like off the plan, and this was probably my frustration, and I sort of started to check out of an off the plan process and we're doing some of that with my new development business. Um, so the usual process is you sort of a developer goes, we go and buy some land, you yep. know, get some approvals to do a development on it, um, and then we market the sale of those properties off the plan, right? Never meet your customers, never mm. meet the future residents. So you've got a real estate agent that goes and does all that hard work for you and talks to people and gets them to sign a contract and pay a deposit, and then you get on and build things. Uh, and then they, you know, the people that are bought off you turn up at your lawyer's office once the building's finished and hand over a cheque for settlement and get a set of keys back and off they go and you sort of part ways at, at the sort of at the, at the sort of the end points, um, you know, as soon as the building's finished for a developer. So um, and there's something a bit funny about that process um, and there was something that it sort of just, you know, it sort of lost the appeal of sort of continuing to develop under that model. But the issue I had is that we'd gone and acquired a really large land bank of housing projects in right. Middle Ring, Melbourne. So, you know, like a couple of thousand apartments of supply and saying so the way in which that housing would typically get delivered in Australia is via off-the-plan sales and mm. development under that model. You know, I'm a bit buggered here. What have I done? I don't, mm. I'm not what, really... what really bugged you, though? Like if you're uh, – because you could just keep going down that model. Like what's, what's really bugging you about it? Well, because you've gone and taken a whole different – yeah, which is a good model, which mm. we'll talk about more. But, yeah. like, what was the catalyst to think that the current system is not what I want to follow? I want to do a new model. Is it because you couldn't sell it or you, you weren't motivated by it? What was actually driving you to go uh, in this new direction? It wasn't because we couldn't sell it. I think, um, you know, the market fluctuates a bit, obviously, but, um, you know, and our brand was pretty solid, so we were, we were sort of able to get the sales yeah. done to the extent we wanted to. It was more the sort of... Um, faceless developer, you know, and, and this sort of thing where we never meet our residents, we never meet these people that are giving us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy real estate off us and that's a generalisation but that's that's a pretty uh, appropriate generalisation. So mm. the majority of developers would be operating under that model where they would very rarely actually meet their, their customers. But so, isn't that probably a developer doesn't really, I mean, doesn't really mind that because, you know, they've bought it, they've sold it, they've made their money, they're on to the next project. 100%. I mean, mm, they don't... Yeah need to connect with no, the end don't. consumer because that's, there's no real need. So that's wh right. why would that why did that bother you, I guess? Well, because that's so what do you achieve as an individual? So that you're achieving capital success. So yep. it's it's you know, that's a good sort of pure model founded in capitalism, which is <laughs> which is fine. So um, but you start to read, you know, the sort of global investment thematic with a bunch of large institutional investors and pension funds and the like about saying, well, 
when we're investing and when we're funding projects and the like, what else are we solving for with those investments? So yep. I started to spend more time in the United States and Western Europe in particular looking at different housing models and trying to understand why large pension fund style investors are investing in whole housing assets and owning those assets longer term yeah. and having a much stronger commercial imperative on them to do a much better job of creating great little neighbourhoods within those buildings in which people can live. So yeah. because you have to, right? So you, you need to want to as well. So you need to be, um, you need to have, you know, a sort of drive or a purpose to want to create a great place for people to live. Yeah. But, you know, there's also, you know, a really strong commercial imperative for you to do so as well because if you've gone and spent You've already hundreds of millions right? of dollars yeah. of money to build a building. You're not a charity. And someone can just move out, <laughs> mm. right, and so I'll just mm. get my bond back, thanks, I'm going to move out. They're not exposed in the yeah. same way as uh, having signed a contract and having a large deposit down. So mm. so I started to investigate a bunch of those things and I was really looking at it through the lens of um, what they would call in the United States multifamily housing, which is basically institutionally owned residential apartment buildings. Yeah. Okay? And in the United States, a lot of that stocks sort of really um, – sort of embellished amenity models. So they would have pools and gyms and libraries yep. and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that you, yep. you don't really need to live a good life. But, um, you know, they charge a premium to market rent for the fact they've got those facilities mm -hmm. and concierge-type services. So, so I started to look at that and thought, you know, that's sort of interesting as a model, but... Um, I'm not sort of the sort of psychology of most Australians... The, the, the sort of psychology of the Australian sort of housing markets um, quite the same as the United States. So I acknowledge that ownership was still important mm. in Australia. So 80% mm -hmm. of young Australians between 20 and 40 still want to own a home at some yeah. point. And I sort of think, well, what's driving that? And, you know, the analogy I use is, you know, if mum and dad bought a house in Glen Waverley for $100,000 35 years ago and it's now worth $1.5 million and that's why they've got the – latest and greatest Jayco and they're at Byron Bay two months a year having a good mm. retirement because of the financial security that a home ownership afforded them, mm. that not being able to achieve that creates a sort of certain level of um, anxiety around mm. someone's financial future and how good of a retirement, you know, a young Australian is going to have when they get to that point in their life. So, yeah. so I get why the ownership thing is important in Australia and it's just because, um, you know, the reality is it's been a – incredible source of wealth for people that have been lucky enough to get into ownership. So And the security element of it, of 100%. course, as well, because, yeah. you know, if you're renting, generally speaking, you're lucky to get a one-year lease. That's right. Two years. Yeah. You know, don't think so. Mm. Um, mm. So, you know, that's you never know what's going to happen in the future. That's right. Yeah. So housing anxiety is a real thing for people that are in the private rental market, so on year-to-year -year leases, so, um, and people that – for whom ownership might not be an option. So stuck yeah. in that short-term leasing cycle and, you know, I guess what does that translate into for an individual's propensity to volunteer, engage in the community in which they're living? Mm. And, you know, human nature would say that they're, that would be lessened, you know, as a result of yep. not knowing if they're actually going to be in that suburb next year. So, so you're going to go their and, time and their energy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. so, um, you know, and there's still little things like, you know, being able to sort of get a GP that you can go to, you know, yeah. over, over, you know, and sort of form a strong relationship with those sorts of things. So that sort of and infrastructure and putting roots down in the communities, something that tenure provides you. And at the moment, as you rightly said, the really the only way to secure that in Australia is via ownership mm -hmm. to get that certainty of being able to be in that location long term. Yeah. Um, so we, we knew ownership was important um, and we started to look at some of the barriers to ownership. So... If you're sort of a low or middle income Australian, um, you know, what are the things that are um, making it difficult for mm. you to get into ownership and to participate in, in that part of the housing market? And one of the big things that we observed, and we got a lot of help from groups like ANZ and KPMG and other sort of data sources on, you know, what are their observations as well. So we developed quite a sophisticated research piece around what are the actual barriers? And time to save was a big one. Yeah. Uh, and not having a fixed goal to work towards was another one. So, we yeah, should, because the markets, by the time you save that money, then right. the market's moved and yeah. <laughs> that's demotivating because you oh. thought you needed 100, but now you need 150. Yeah. 100%. That's, yeah. that's the experience. And people have this arms in the air moment and they go, just like, F this, this is nonsense. This market's yeah. not designed for me. 
you know, I'm going to go on holiday to Thailand for four months and spend my money on that yep. or whatever it is. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. So I just, sort of, <laughs> sort of sort of say, just bugger it. Like, mm. and it's this sort of, yeah. you know, I'm going to go and get a jet ski or whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But, they're, you know, they're, and it's, it's sort of... Um, it's you know we don't you know we we, we clearly there's a sort of deep sort of social purpose to what we're doing and we try and understand how people are feeling about housing um but you know they, they're sort of real issues you know um sort of social issues in this country and you know and that what that does to someone's peace of mind where if you say you know in a hierarchy of human needs shelters you know, a cornerstone at the bottom yeah. of the pyramid, mm. right? So that's fundamental for someone's, you know, emotional sort of security um, and how they're feeling about themselves and their future. So we um, so we designed a model where we said we worked out it was about seven years. If someone had a fixed goal to work, work towards to save a sort of 15 to 20% deposit based off some income um, analysis that we'd done, they'd need about seven years to save up and qualify for a mortgage based off what we know today. Right. Mm-hmm. Assuming things are relatively the same in Is this seven specifically years. specifically Melbourne? Uh, yeah, so we look at Melbourne, Sydney. We're, um, we're going to Brisbane next. So, okay. yeah, so yeah. Um, the incomes, um, the issues are, this, are similar in, di- in different locations mm-hmm. around Australia and different cities. Um you know, there's sort of there's sort of geo specific considerations, I guess, in different spots. But you know, the reality is, you know, um, you know, a sort of nurse in Brisbane, you know, gets paid, you know, similar to a nurse yeah. in Melbourne, sort of thing. So, but the housing's uh, cheaper in Brisbane. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so it takes but, less time but your to, biggest problems to save. Are probably are in Melbourne and Sydney, right? Yeah. yeah. My yeah. home ownership's out of reach. Yeah. And so they're going well. My only option's either to. You know, we're well, never going to achieve it. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep saving, and then when I the time I get there, it's going to keep going. So there's well, not. There, yeah, there was some hmm. recent data that said that it took an individual 12 years to save a deposit in Sydney, yeah. nine years in Melbourne. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. so obviously it's yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. So that's insurmountable challenge. It is. Yeah. So yeah. we work on about seven years, and. We sort of say if someone's only got a dollar left in their bank after they've paid their bond to yeah. sort of secure their spot, then, you know, what sort of a savings rhythm can they get into? Um, so we basically, you know, what you would call off the plan, we can, we allow someone to enter into an agreement where they we would commit to them having a five-year lease. Right. So, but they're not locked in. They can leave after 12 months or two years or three years and yeah. if it's just not working for them anymore. And they also get a free option to acquire the property at the end of the five-year lease. Mm-hmm. Um so, and that's for a pre-agreed price. So we pre-agree rent. So people don't sort of sign up blind to anything. So they know exactly how much their rent's going to be for each mm-hmm. of the five years. And they have a pre-agreed contracted price, which they can work towards. So, but they're not obliged to buy mm-hmm. any savings they make just sit in their sort of, you know, dolomite account or whatever they've sort of got, yeah. you know, from primary school <laughs> days. Still, is that got, a similar price still. to what they would buy? Let's say it's yeah. it like two, three bedroom apartments, one yeah. bedroom. Uh, so we... We sort of had a hypothesis about what people needed, you know, because you, when you're doing something new, you've sort of got to, I guess you've got to, you've got to, you've got to frame it somehow. Um, we thought everyone would need at least two bedrooms because over such a long period of time, their household formation form might change yep. a bit. They might get into a relationship, have children, get five cats, whatever they want to do. <laughs> so, um, so, but that was wrong. So, um, you know, it was right in part, sorry. So what we got wrong was the latent demand for one bedroom apartments. So, and particularly from over 55, 60 people that are um, single person households, particularly single women. Mm. Some of the most vulnerable, I guess. Yeah, Mm. yeah. So that was, so in our next project, we've now had a much deeper focus on that product. So we're getting more and more data all the time as more people register interest in being in one of our buildings. Okay, so let's wind it back a bit. So how do you then decide on what site can fulfil this goal? So what we do is we look at it so we don't go down to our local architect and say we've got a site and can you design us a beautiful building and then sort of back solve to how much rent or how much mm. we need to sell the properties for to make the project viable for us. Yeah. So we look at um, median area incomes for a location that we want to be in and we look at sort of different, so for a single couple, no dependents, family, so across sort of lower middle income bands and we look at how much those people can afford to pay in rent um, during the five-year period and what's an affordable rent for them with still having the capacity to save on top of that. So you're specifically targeting locations based on yeah. incomes? Yeah, so we are. So we won't, you know, we can't... Um, so what's a, what's a good way to describe it? So 
our housing format, the apartment formats, they wouldn't work in Pakenham because you can still go and buy rent a four-bedroom house for 400 bucks a week or something in Pakenham, right? Right. or buy, buy a house and land for 350000 But you so, don't want to go somewhere where the land is too expensive for you to be able to no, achieve so, it, so you've got to go middle yeah, of the road a bit. So the psychology of our suburbs is probably important as well. So we think that there's um, the way that we sort of design our buildings and the way that people are sort of interested in being, you know, sort of having a meaningful relationship with their neighbours in our mm. buildings and things. Is, yep. So areas like Kensington, Brunswick, Abbotsford, you know, Bentley, Clayton in the southeast of Melbourne. So, um, like, we're looking more in Gabba in Brisbane at the moment. So there's sort of certain locations that we think sort of Pretty are brand urban. appropriate. Oh, they're definitely yeah, urban. Yeah, yeah. So we need to be in locations where so we provide a much higher level of communal amen- uh, communal spaces in our buildings than a typical building would provide. Right. Yeah. But we also locate ourselves in locations where there's extremely high levels of existing infrastructure mm. in the existing suburbs. So... Um, you know, and we do a lot of work with state government talking to them about how much more cost effective it is for, say, a state government to locate households mm-hmm. um, where they can augment existing infrastructure rather than starting from scratch in mm-hmm. a greenfields context. So, And everyone in these, so, you know, I guess it's for our listeners, they've kind of got a, you've got a block of land, you're a developer, yeah. you've, got, um, you've got to, you know, sell, sell these or, or go through the project, you've got institutional money. Mm-hmm. Funding it, yeah. So it allows you to build it, and then everyone in that apartment complex have all signed up to a five-year lease mm-hmm. um, that they can break. That, <laughs> they, they can, can leave, break. yeah. So yeah. they can leave, but they pay a bond or something. Yeah, to they stop get, that. that sits with the RT, the Residential yeah. Tenancies Bond Authority. So just yeah. in a normal way. So, but I mean, in terms of you know, you'd like to think that they're all trying to get the home ownership because mm. to go through this process, if, unless you're taking it serious, you might as well just rent. Something well, else, right? We think like, it's if yeah, that's right. You so, know, serious that the housing market isn't designed for them, for instance, and they're presented with an opportunity to actually work towards something, as you yeah. say, then that's that's well, because they're not paying anything to have the option to buy it, and because there's no sort of penalty if they don't decide to buy it, mm. you, know, you know, down the track, then um, you know, it's sort of like a why wouldn't you? Mm. Like, it's mm. sort of if you're just going to be renting anyway yeah. around the corner, yeah, yeah. why wouldn't you? Uh, being one of our mm. buildings, they're sort of occupants focused design apartments. So we've sort of got a, a sort of deep focus on occupant sort of comfort and um, and look at it. We don't sort of in, we don't do sort of embellished apartments with all sort of fancy light fittings and things. We do sort of robust mm. and we put the money into the things that are actually important, you know, in the quality of an apartment. So what the building? Oh, the, yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are, yeah. So <laughs> not um, the taps. And the no, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, not the sort of fancy not taps. The yeah. So <laughs> so we do a lot of work on that. Um, and lost my train of thought here a bit, but there. Um, well, you've got it because you're. Yeah. If you're so, going to, you, you still own it, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah. So you've. It has it. to be better. Um, yeah, you know, you mm. as, as a. You cop the defects. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, to be honest, like if someone tap keeps breaking, the kitchen tap keeps sort of falling off or something like that. They so look, stuff this, Chris. Like this mm. is not what you sort of told me I was going to mm. get. So I'm just going to leave at the end of this year and just give us my bond back, and I'm sort of going to move back around the corner. Yeah. So. So that's part of it. So there's this sort of financial journey that people go on and we've got a um, financial coaching program that we provide free of charge so mm-hmm. where people can – because some people don't even know what a mortgage is, right, because mm. they've never thought about home ownership because they didn't think that was something that was ever going yeah. to be available wow, to them. So yeah. we try and help upskill them a bit in just basic stuff. So, you know, sort of how do you form a household budget? You should set up a separate account to, mm. you know, direct deposit some savings into and all those sorts of things. So some simple – tools to help people get a better relationship with money and from my perspective and from the investor's perspective that's a sensible thing for us to provide because it means that people are more likely to get into some good sort of habitual savings and when it comes to the end of their lease they're more likely to be in a position with our support to Mm -hmm. achieve their their sort of ownership dream. And how do you stop people uh, you know once they kind of get to the five years um can the investors, if you don't sell them, do you have to sell them to other people who are going to live in them? Is it all going to be owner occupiers, or is yeah, it going we, to then shift to, well, actually, now it's all of a sudden it's becoming owner occupiers, renters that want to buy it, but then also just renters. Mm. And then the building composition starts to shift from a community focused building where everyone owns or everyone wants to own yeah. a building yeah. to a traditional off the plan building where you do get a high concentration of inve- renters. And investors, which 
generally speaking, there's a lot more kind of mm. transient sort of building. Yeah. Is how are you going to stop that? So, you know, the sort of we don't try and engineer outcomes in the community in which live in our buildings, but um, you know, this the the sort of you know, the, the utopia would be that, you know, everyone's just sort of gonna live a happy life there together and the sort of people that went in day one are gonna be the people that are there in twenty years time. It's just yeah. un, it's unrealistic, right? So that's yeah. that's not going to be the case. And people's circumstances over the five year lease will change as well. Mm. You know, yes. people might lose a job or have a relationship breakdown or whatever. Something will happen mm. and that means that not everyone's going to be able to buy off us. So we would say if there was 100 apartments and 80 people, you know, sort of achieved their um, ownership goal with us yeah. and then we had 20 left, then we would dispose of those in an orderly way on market. Mm-hmm. And we're up front with people about this. We're yeah. saying whilst we're happy to, ex- you know, accept probably one quarter of the returns f- from these projects it would make if we are doing off the plan, for example, mm-hmm. it's still an investment. One quarter, that's the- about one quarter. We would make about 25% of the sort of annual returns that we would compared to doing off the plan. Right. So it's a much more sort of, you know, those the investors sort of talk about it as a sort of long and low. So it's long-term investment but much lower returns. Yep. So, um, and the reason that the superannuation funds are happy to support that is because they see it as although it's a lower return compared to doing much higher risk off the plan development, yep. they say, well, it's actually hitting a whole bunch of other sort of social sustainability corporate objectives that we've got mm-hmm. around... And so if you've got funding from, you know, I guess super funds that will allow you to scale this model out? Yeah. So we're, um, we'll be announcing a, a very large investment from one of the largest super funds in the country in the next sort of month, six weeks, wow. um, which is really exciting. So, um, And they're attracted to what we're doing because of the sort of social purpose around it as well as being what they think's you know, they look at a lot of different models and affordable housing models and the like and yeah. they sort of see our model and the way that Assemble's pitching itself and the sort of service offer that we provide to our residents as being quite unique um, and something that can solve, you know, sort of a lot of barriers that people are seeing in housing. So, yeah. um, And it's pretty applicable to a lot of the largest super funds are sort of member union-based funds. Mm-hmm. So... So they're like janitorial staff, them. you know, yeah. hospitality staff. So they're yeah. right in our hitting zone, you know, in terms yeah, of salaries yeah, and, yeah. you know, they're the sort of people that, you know, they sort yeah. of, we always talk about key workers and things, but, you know, I think the reality is for most people, probably the most important key worker in their suburbs, their barista, right? Yeah. So, so they're kind of like, you know, it's sort of life or death sometimes going to work yeah. and getting that morning coffee, it seems <laughs> like it. But so they say, well, if, but if the, Barista, you know, for whatever reason, yeah. you know, just can't afford to live in that location or sort of, mm. so, you know, so we're just sort of just providing some options for people that might otherwise get dislocated to outer areas or. So in the, in the past, in, we haven't had, you know, a problem where we haven't got a, a problem like potentially with not enough quality properties that families want to kind of live in. We've got a lot of stuff that's potentially uh, investors have bought and people are happy to rent, but they don't really want to buy them and, live in them, let's say apartments. Um, but in like, you know, in, in countries around the world, the government have kind of stepped in and built lots of housing. That's right. You know, like the UK yeah. built lots of council housing and they they kind of be the developer, you know, and then they allow kind of people in the community to kind of buy it back off the council, right? That's you right. Yeah. Um, but we haven't done that in Australia. So you're kind of seeing there's a yeah. huge gap between, you know, what, you know, developers are building and then what society needs and you're trying to bridge that. Mm. Yeah, we sort of talk a bit about bridging the gap or talk a bit about the missing middle in housing. So say so very low income housing, so like deep government subsidy type housing. So that's what we would call, you know, commissioned housing or social housing here. Mm. Um, we haven't really built that, have we? Really no, so much. government's got a couple of programs. There's a incredible um shortfall of public housing in Victoria. I think yeah. the current waiting list, sixty three thousand Victorian families on a waiting list to Yeah get into, you know, social housing dwelling. So that's, we you know, in this country Michelle that's quite... Adair from yeah. Housing yeah. Trust, I think, yeah. Yeah. some time ago, and she, I think she said something like a nine or ten-year waiting list. Yeah, it's quite class. disgraceful actually. Yeah, yeah. But, mm. um, but, look, they've got a tough job and government's got a lot of sort of, you know, government's got a limited budget and they've got a sort of a lot of competing objectives mm. and they've been very focused on sort of roads and rail and stuff like that and transport. Mm-hmm. Um, I... Um, spend a fair bit of time with with the state and um, and they're 
now their sort of lens is turning to housing as being sort of critical social infrastructure. So, you know, and they're starting to look more at saying, well, if we don't provide this housing, what's the real long-term cost to an economy or the state budget for, yeah. you know, things like mental health issues and a whole bunch of stuff that goes mm. with not providing that housing. So, well, so we operate in the middle. Falling at the bottom, right? Yeah. You know, if there's someone moves into the house but you're not building it, there's someone that's getting pushed out, mm. hence why we're getting homelessness that's rising. That's knock-on. And, mm. you know, and um, especially if... You know, families are kind of splitting and, you know, you need two mm. houses and a family gets divorced, but then they haven't got the money and then where do they go, you know, and, and things like that. So <laughs> yeah, there's lots of... That's right. So have you got any developments that have actually got gone the five years yet? Not yet. Mm. So we've got our first site under construction in Kensington. Oh, right. So this um, is very Greenfield. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So we're just, we're just um, getting going really, just getting a bit of momentum up. But we've got, uh, we had about... Um, 4,000 people registered their interest in the first 60 apartments there. Um, and then we've got another project around the corner, which is 200 apartments. So we're sort of doing, that's about our size. We think about 200 apartments um, in a building. Um, we've got about 800 apartments committed in Melbourne to that part of the business. And then we've got separately about 1,700 apartments that we will build and they'll be, it'll be assembled housing, but it would just be available for rental. So there won't mm-hmm. be... So a complete build-to-rent model. Yeah. Yeah. And are you saying that, um, you know, I think the build-to-rent thing's great, but, you know, it's it's at some point, um, you know, your life changes and you want to own. Mm. So do you think that's the biggest flaw with that model is that you are going to get people who are just renting, but they at some point are not going to get to retirement with no home. Yeah. So um, it's not really, it's suiting just a gap. Yeah, look, it is, you know, and look, ownership's not the sort of be all and end all, but, it, you know, it, it has been important in the past and I think it will continue to be so. Um, so we look at ownership's just not an option for some people and they yeah. just will never get themselves mm. into a position to own a home. So so if their choices are to participate in the private rental market with mum and dad investor-owned stuff where they're subject to short leases and things mm. or they can be in a building that's owned by an institutional investor that's purpose-built rental accommodation and they know that as long as they sort of keep paying their rent, they're likely to be able to be there for as long as they choose to. So we think that's, you know, sort of solving a, a different part of the, you know, some issues in housing. So we've sort of got one model which is clearly about, you know, working with people to get them into ownership and getting giving them tenure buyer ownership um, and then the stuff that's just available for rental gives people the certainty that, you know, they've still got tenure. It's just yeah. a rental thing, but, you know, it's sort of still gives them it's a bit of a soul. Yeah. yeah. You know, and 34% of, you know, Australian households rent. So, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing. It's a big market. Um, so, and the benefits that we can provide as a, a sort of institutional um, residential building owner and the sort of service offer and some of the things that we can sort of bulk buy, like we run our own data and power networks and we'll sort of save people 20% on their sort of bills compared to what they would be if they were just in a normal apartment. You know, we bulk buy sort of coffee beans and, (laughs) you know, you just sort of name it and we sort of use, we've got about 7,000 people in our database now and we use the power of themselves to get them a better deal on mm. farm direct mm. groceries, you know, loo paper, you know, it. they've mm. sort of got a whole bunch of stuff. So we can provide a cost of living advantage in our buildings as well that mm. in a traditional development model you'd be less focused on it. So yeah. you sort of say, well, you know, we've, you know, if the building's finished, we're moving on, we're going to go on to our next project like you said earlier. And, and how do they, those builders that are, they're already having a bit of a problem right now mm. because there's a bit of a... Yeah. a Miss and as well, a confidence has confidence. been shot. Yeah, has been completely shot in the product. So, yeah. but you got um, four thousand people on your wedding list yeah. for this one. Well, yeah, how do they feel about you as a business? Because you're a disruptor, right? You're creating a new mm. model that's potentially not as profitable as mm. their old model. Yeah, how do they kind of look at you as a business? And um, you know, do they really want to change to building better products, or are they just there to? I don't know. Maybe they think I'm crazy. Who knows? We'll see. There, uh, <laughs> we'll see. We're going to get a couple of buildings built first, but we're we're making good progress. But I think, um, as I think I said earlier, I think the there are issues with the industry, but some of that's a bit of a generalisation. I think a lot of people, a lot of good developers, are getting sort of tarred with a brush of you know a sort of a, a few bad ones. Um, but you know, I think there's a lot of developers around looking at different ways to you know, develop housing um, rather than just sort of relying on this very cyclical sort of off-the-plan sales type environment. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether or not they're 
um, you know, we're not the only ones looking at build to rent. You know, there's other businesses like Mervac and yeah. Procon and others that are mm-hmm. looking in that space, but they're probably looking at the sort of higher amenity type models. So, mm-hmm. um, whereas we're more sort of operating in a sort of paired back approach and trying to target more affordable rents. So the elephant in the room is 100% for you. The reason that Chris and I do this podcast is because we passionately believe that property buyers can do it better. We really want to help all of you understand all the risks, but also the ways in which you can avoid your elephant making the decisions. But what we would love for you to do is just to share this episode and share other episodes with people around you that are going through the property process. Give us a review on iTunes. A five star, please, would be very appreciated because because this is about making sure that we all benefit from the wonderful information that our guests have been sharing with us. Let's say build rent takes off. Yeah. And hopefully it does because there are... I think it will. Yeah, yeah, part of the population that needs to rent. And they now look at... They've got two options. They can go rent in a build to rent where they know they can stay as long as they want. They're Mm. not going to get kicked out Mm. in a year's time. Or they could go and sign a 12-month lease in an older building that was potentially poorly built um, Mm. or it's got problems with the building and they can only sign 12 months. What's going to happen to those buildings and those, you know, in terms of their (sighs) marketability? Because people are going to be like, if you are going to rent, why would I rent that? Yeah. But I can rent build to rent. Look, I think short term, not much is going to happen because the, you know, the vacancy is so low. Yeah. Yeah, But medium to long term, I think build to rent and institutionally owned residential buildings um, that have got a much higher service offer, you know, they're better to live in, they're cheaper to live in, you know, you get you know, you get a lot more help living there than you would in a normal residential yep. building, will become a, you know, it'll be a pretty binary choice for people and I think they'll be saying, you know, I'd rather be in a sort of institutionally controlled rental environment. Institutional is probably not the right word. It sounds a bit like an <laughs> yeah. asylum, doesn't it? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah, so a professionally run you yeah. know, housing yes. asset um, compared okay. to just like an owner's corporation thing mm-hmm. where, you know, because I sort of, we, um, we, were, we were renting an apartment in Elwood recently and we, um, the tap broke in the bathroom and like just the experience as a renter, it's pretty poor, you mm-hmm. know, so I had to ring the local real estate agent in Ormond Road, Elwood, and mm-hmm. they eventually got back to me the next day and then the plumber got cranky with me because I couldn't be there at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday to meet them. And yeah. so a lot of those sort of issues and just that sort of, you know, the administration of the rental experience is something that you know is a lot easier when you've got a building that's controlled in one line by a, you know, yeah. a sort of professional. So you got a building manager yeah. and a community Community scheme. So, and- yeah, we have a big focus on developing the social equity mm. in the in the building. So um, we provide spaces like so we don't do gyms and pools and all this sort of stuff that yeah, you don't sort of really need to live a good life. We provide spaces like workshops where you know, people can go and fix a bike together or paint a chair yeah. together yeah. and um, multifunction communal rooms where you could sort of do they might do yoga in the morning and then people might work mm-hmm. from home there during the day and um, so, and what it is, it's about, so we don't do sort of wine and cheese pairing nights and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So we just allow community to form, you know, in a pretty organic way and for yeah. just provide spaces for sort of unforced social interaction. And we facilitate things, you know, like walking groups and yoga classes and we provide occasional care and we might do sort of potluck dinners and, and the like, but it's all opt in, you know, some yeah. people just want to go home, you know, jump in the lift, go to their apartment and watch My Kitchen Rules and go to bed or whatever, so yeah. sort of thing. So, and But some people are have a, I think for some people what they're sort of missing in their, you know, potentially in their sort of current um, living circumstance is that ability to sort of form deeper relationships with yeah. other people in their community. So it's got a bit of and the that, co-living it element does a bit, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So um, it does. So it's definitely um, the sort of service design approach around saying, well, what are the sort of spaces that you need to provide in a building and what's the sort of service style that you you need to design to, you know, allow community to form. Mm-hmm. So the objective is to say, well, um, that over time potentially the community starts to self-curate. So they don't actually need us there sort of organising a walking yeah. group on a Wednesday morning or doing the yoga or things like that. So... And that's a lot more the sort of housing cooperative model from um, mm-hmm. places like Netherlands or Switzerland. Where Is that why you said 200 apartments? Because, I mean, the bigger the, you know, we're sorry, there's a 
can only have 100 people in your life that you can have a relationship with yeah, or something like that. So yeah, that's right. In so. terms of groups, you can only know that many people. Yeah, I mean, there's you start to not be able to take on Manage more people, you know. So, so we guess, do a lot of work on cohort sizing. So yeah. which um, – and what does that mean? So that means that um, – for example, you might get a lift in one of our buildings to level three and you sort of go left out of the lift and we sort of think about this as like a little cul-de-sac. So it wouldn't have more than eight or ten apartments in that right. little group yep. of right. apartments because that's about the number of households that can sort of start to form into a group and then mm-hmm. in a bigger community it might be 40 to 50 apartments in a sort of part of a building mm-hmm. and then so but a 200 apartment building might be sort of a collection of four, four of these silence, little neighbourhoods. Yeah, yeah so... Mm. Um, What's some research done actually about the mm. optimum um, apartment number in a building mm, for living, mm, optimal yeah. living? And it apparently it was 40. Yeah. So, you know, if, you've probably got all that research, haven't you? Yeah, we, well, we do. We've got a lot of research. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of lever arch folders in the, in the office. But they're, um, they're one of the, like the if, if, if you're just looking at it from the investment lens, it'd be mm. the bigger the better, yeah. right? So, because you just yeah. get all these efficiencies that come with scale. So, for our first project, which was only 70 apartments, we actually go backwards managing a project of that scale, but it was a manageable sort of pilot project site type scale. So um, we need to sort of get to 150 apartments plus for that to be an economic size for us to deliver the sort of service yeah. that we want to provide to the communities. So, so but a traditional developer would say, you know, I've got a this block of land, I can fit 350 apartments on it, let's just go for it, right? That's probably where your profit margin is right. getting hit. Yeah. It's because you're saying, well, let's only build 250, you know, let's yeah. create an, you know, a bit more community space, mm. let's create a bit more green space, yeah. um, et cetera. Yeah. And you can do that because you've got institutional funding There's that yeah. driving the metrics. That's, that's that- right, 100%, yeah. So yeah. They, they're happy to um, invest for lower returns over the sort of longer term, but um, it's a bit about saying, you know, we provide communal spaces and we do sort of mid-scale developments because... Um, you know, there's some commerce in that as well. So they're, they're, they're a size that we know we can manage. We think community will be able to f- form in, commu- in buildings of that size. So, mm. And there's a whole bunch of data around this from, the say, the US as well where the data says that if an individual in an apartment building makes two meaningful friendships with two other households, they'll stay 2.5 to three times longer than someone that feels isolated. Oh, yeah. So. Sense. So the, that sort of community curation piece has an investment logic to it as well. Mm. Um, from the I'm not leaving unless you leave. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So yeah, they're kind of same with suburbs yeah. and streets and yeah. you know. So, so, but, so on the other side of the business, so the make side of the business. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was looking at your website and there's some some massive developments that you guys are involved mm. in. It was like well, one complex, what six thousand, three thousand, almost three thousand apartments, mm. and another one with um, twenty seven hectares. How, so I'm presuming that's in the sort of more traditional development uh, model? Most of that housing will get delivered by Assemble. Right, So right. as either purpose-built rental accommodation wow. or via our home ownership pathway model. Mm. Um, so um, so we won't probably do any build to sell under the sort of make umbrella off wow, the plan development. Wow, those huge, wow, that's Yeah, that's so we, you know, we might do a component of it, but we may do that under the, the Assemble brand. We've actually got a lot of people that actually just want to buy now, but they want to be in an assembled community in one yes. of our neighbourhoods So because they like the way that we look at design. Right. They know that we're you know, focused on quality and some mm. of those other things. So, Well, you'd want to be in that building because if it's part ownership, right, if the building's going to get taken care of because they're invested 100%. in the outcome. Oh, yeah, you're not, you're not and, see you um, later. Yeah. you got the keys. I'm yeah, out yeah, of here. That's yeah. right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's their biggest fear probably yeah. right now is that they get the keys, they move in, and then they start getting defects and the building's... No, it hasn't been built with the best intentions. Well, I think in the past it hasn't been a big enough fear just quietly. Now it's becoming obvious why people should have been fearing this. That's right, yeah. it's a Look, it's a big thing for people and, you know, I'm I'm doing it every day and I still find it hard. You know, the the process of sort of going to a sales suite and looking at an A3 sheet of paper and even just yeah. visualising actually how, how big is a 50 square metre apartment. Yeah. And, you know, don't, you don't really know. So so there's sort of a whole bunch of, <laughs> yeah. so to be able to sort of live in there and work out whether you've got room for the cats or whatever you've got, you know, is a, um, you know, a sort of much more sensible way in our view to sort of enter a market and make such a big decision like that. So, mm. Mm. What about the capital value? Like if it's one thing kind of buying the property, mm. but if the capital value doesn't go up from an investment point of yeah. view, is that really a sound decision? For the person in five years' time, have you done enough 
kind of, you know, I guess figuring out how do we make sure that asset value goes up over mm. time um, yeah. and keeps rising because why would you want to own it if it's not going to go up in value, I guess, mm. in five years? I can rent it. I can mm. get it from a security point of view. Yeah. But it doesn't make sense from an investment point but of view. They don't yeah, even need it from security because basically they can, they can rent there for well, they can, rent they can it, go yeah. on the build a rent site. That's right, yeah. So, look, I think, like, we can't, you know, we, we do a lot of modelling on what we think the market might look like in the future and there's some sort of things like replacement cost indices and things that sort of drive growth in in prices, but it's all a bit sort of boring. I guess the beauty of what we're offering people is saying, well, they get a free look at the market. In So now it's in 2026. We'll pre-agree a price they can buy it for in 2026, mm-hmm. um, and they've got seven years to work away and save. If the price then doesn't make sense to them or the apartment doesn't make sense, they can walk away and they're no worse off as a result of that experience. Mm-hmm. Right. So, but we do model. We say, well, if an area like Kensington, where long-term capital growth might be seven and a half to eight percent, um, that's what we've seen. You know, the last right. eighteen months has been a bit different per yeah. annum. And we say, well, let's just say that halves. So we sort of get back to a more sort of stable market. And maybe capital growth mod, uh, moderates to say four percent per year. Mm-hmm. So if from where we're at today, if that 4% rate's achieved, then our residents will be basically buying at a 20% discount to market value in the future. So so we can't sort of promise mm. that. And we don't use that often in the marketing because we sort of, it feels a bit sort of spruikery sort of thing. Like mm. you're sort of, yeah, you're sort of just trying to sort of, sound seems a bit too good to be true. But yeah. we do you give people to, data. Yeah, and they say, yeah, <laughs> that's, well, you don't need to, yeah. But it's, people are... You know, people sort of like to understand it and, you know, if, you know, if I was, you know, I'd do a lot of, we'd obviously do a lot of real estate, you know, if it was me, you know, I'd love to be able to go and sort of take this sort of free option to buy 50 of them, right, you know, mm-hmm. and if you can just walk away mm-hmm. in the future, you know, why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. So, um, but, you know, obviously that's not <laughs> that's not available to us. So I guess we are, yeah. we are in a way, we probably own lots of them, don't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I guess you, yeah. uh, I mean, it would make sense in five years' time because if the building is built well, yeah. so you're not worried about that, yeah. it has got a good community, then that's great. Mm. Um, and it is quite scarce because while you might have, you know, great intentions to be building these all over the country, you know, there's only so much you as a model can Produce right. That's right. And so those buildings with these good communities, when you break it down, there's still going to be a very small percentage of mm. the apartment options out there. So you might be able to create capital growth because that's a good observation. People yeah. might really want to be in a community-driven. Yeah. That's right. New housing. So so we've. But then you start pushing out the market you were trying to achieve in the first place because that's interesting too. Um, <laughs> yeah. The people yeah. will sell it mm. Um, mm. because they'll go well. I. Um, can profit on this, yep. and then they sell it to someone who's got money, and mm. then the affordable housing starts to move oh, out of yeah, the system. And we, yeah, so we don't um, try and grandfather an affordability outcome with our housing. Our sort of view is that if we can support those groups of people that are sort of participating yes. in the modelling to ownership, and if they go and sell the apartment the day after they've bought it from us at the end of the fifth year and make another hundred grand profit, plus they've got all their savings, and that means that they can go into some different accommodation that mm-hmm. suits them better at that point in time or whatever. We think that's good. Yeah, okay, so and they may well have been good friends with two other yeah, apartment owners and not want to leave. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they might just yeah choose so and um, so we don't have an issue with that. Like we think no. that's okay. And my sort of view on it is I say well. To be honest, like if someone's been there and they've been a good tenant and been paying rent for five years and they've done well out of this whole thing financially and that's helped them have a better financial future than they would have had without our model, then that's good. You've achieved you know, it. You've done something, yeah. Mm. So, But is there any limitations on who you're accepting? Because how do you, let's say you've got 4,000 people and you've got 65 apartments, then how do you decide, how do you decide who gets it? Because Out of a hat. Is it? What your fancy hat? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're um. But yeah, so someone's it's about earning two hundred grand a year, and someone's earning sixty grand. Okay. One's a key worker, and one's yeah. not. So we have some apartments which are means tested. Okay, so they're like a dedicated key worker allocation. Mm. The rest of it, you know, we don't have an issue if someone's on a higher salary and they, you know, you know, they deserve to be in a sort of engaged community as well. They obviously don't need as much help in housing as others, mm. but. I get very nervous about trying to engineer an outcome too much. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, having dedicated allocations to certain socioeconomic groups is important. But mm-hmm. for me to sort of... of people's exactly. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like saying, well, you know, the, you know, if you sort of get a, a sort of junior partner in there or, you know, they're only $200,000 a year at the local law firm, then, you know, 
Uh, you know, they might be good and they might be able to help everyone with their sort of <laughs> contracts and everything <laughs> at the end when they're buying it or something. But yeah. who is knows? There, but is yeah. there significance of the five years? Like is there a reason why uh, it's five years? The seven years um, was the period that we worked out we thought people needed to save a deposit. Yeah. So, and the, so the way that works is there's – Two years of building the building mm. and then a five-year lease. So that's seven years. Oh, right. So they commit oh. yeah. at the beginning Yeah, so of basically off the plan uh, right, right. in advance of construction. Right. So, and but we, they're not we, committing to anything besides Just the renting it for a year. Renting yeah, it for yeah, a year. Yeah, and putting their bond down. Um, so could you force them to do that though? You could, we wouldn't. Yeah, so we, we're up front with people. So, look, if your circumstances change and you don't want to go ahead, we will – put their apartment back to our database and try and reallocate it to mm. someone else. Mm-hmm. So um, we think based off the demand we've got, that should be relatively easily achieved. Um, so we don't need to commit to people off the plan, but the logic to that is saying we want to give people the maximum period possible to save, mm. to be able to sort of get into ownership. Um, and we start the financial coaching program during the construction period. Yeah, okay. So they start to develop some of those habits and get themselves sort of set up for success, I guess. Um yeah, so it's, no, it's good. I think the um, the only challenge I think is that, like you say, if someone is in their early fifties, for example, and mm. they are coming to you, uh, seven years, they haven't got seven years, for example, mm. and mm. they could buy it, but then do they get the mortgage at fifty seven? Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, and so you might find that that's a market where getting mm. the loans might a problem. It might only suit people mm. in their say thirties, forties, where. They yeah. can actually get the loan in five years' time. Mm. So about three quarters of the people that are interested in being in our buildings are that younger demographic. Okay. Uh, and then we've sort of got a mix above that and then, you know, with a bit of a skew towards people over 55, 60. So they've got different challenges that they need to think about and different mm-hmm. considerations. But we capture a whole bunch of So when people make an application, they give us information on current level of household savings, salaries, job prospects, a whole bunch of stuff that we help use to... Because we're very conscious too that we don't want to put people and we tell people for all these different apartment types, this is the sort of salary you would need to be on for that to be an affordable option for you and for you to mm. be likely to be able to so we say, you know, unless you're earning sixty thousand dollars a year for this apartment, you know, that's probably not gonna yes. be a good option for you because we don't want people to who might be able Absolutely. to plug away and make the rent and everything else, but if they can't save and it just sort of Oh, yeah, all sort of turns to custard yeah. for them. Yeah, it, mm. it's sort of selling them into this sort of false hope that, you know, these guys are great, they're going to get me into ownership. But yeah. So we've got to be upfront with people about the sort of level of salary they would need in 2019 to be likely to be able to afford the property in 2026. Um, so, but you're right. So um, we saw with a lot of the older demographics that they were in a materially different position financially than mm. the people sort of, you know, in their 20s. Mm. Yeah, so, but... Mm. And so, I mean, I just want to find out around the development side. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, a lot of our listeners have kind of know that we don't really like off the plan for a lot of the risks. Yeah. What's what's your thoughts? Why, why do you think that, you know, someone should buy off the plan when they know all these risks around asset value, build quality, you know, contract risks around, you know, um, you know, could settle settlement risk? And prices falling. I mean, mm. it seems like there's lots of risks, but you know, they're not really the developers not taking on much themselves. Mm. Mm. Um, like yeah. build no no warranty, etc. Like that. So, yeah. how do you think <laughs> that it actually? How do these scales get a bit more fairer for the person buying the building? Um, yeah, look, I think off the plan as a model has its challenges, but it's it's also done a pretty good job of providing housing, like we sort of said earlier. Um, I think models like our model and sort of other models that are, that are sort of emerging in the market are, are going to sort of help shift the scales a little bit towards just giving people choice, whereas, you know, five years ago there wasn't really any choice. Yeah. If you wanted a new apartment, you would buy that off the plan and pay a 10% deposit and yeah. you'd settle sort of two weeks after it where the construction was completed or you'd lose your deposit mm-hmm. and, and sort of... So, um, so people, you know, if, you, if you're in a position to buy now and... Um, you need to sort of, you know, you need to sort of do some, and I think people are getting better at their research piece. So there's not that sort of urgency in the market at the moment where people yeah. just sort of feel like they need to queue up outside the sales suite door to sort of get in there and yeah. put their deposit down. But that, in some I don't developers, think that's about research. I just think that's about consumer sentiment. That, yeah. that, that's purely just lack of FOMO. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, I meant that. You know, they need, yeah, yeah, do their research about saying who is the developer, mm. who's funding it. 
let's go and have a look at a couple of other buildings that they finished that were finished mm. five years ago and, you know, yeah. see how they're looking, maybe even have a chat to people that are sort of living in there and yeah. see whether the apartments are good. So, you know, you, you can't sort of commit these huge decisions to chance, so you need to do some work mm. around that. And I think yeah. off the plan's still a good option for some Australians that are ready to buy now, but... Um, you know, I think it's definitely got its challenges. So, and it is a heck of a lot of money to sort of commit to something sight unseen. Off a- I think, and well, it is absolutely. And I think you know, I think you alluded to people maybe overestimate their ability to read a drawing. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also very few of those developer plans have got dimensions on them. You know, they they look big. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. um, you really do have to look very hard to find the exact size. And, of course, there's a variation allowed, you know, in there as well. But I, one of the things about the defects, though, because the, the reality is that, you know, we know that not all developers and builders are bad, that that plenty have supported their buildings and have mm. have gone in and fixed it, attended to defects and everything. But the fact is a very, very large proportion of buildings, certainly New South Wales is the worst, as it seems to be, <laughs> over 90% of mm. buildings in, in New South Wales appear to have defects in multiple areas yep. um, within the first seven years. 70-odd yep. percent Queensland, 70-odd percent in Victoria. So it's a fact that there are defects. So, I mean, how does a consumer, how does somebody who's thinking about buying off the plan, how do they work out how that builder, that developer attends to defects? Also given that quite often they'll They'll have a like a, a company or two dollar mm. company just mm. for the actual build yeah, definitely. period of time. Mm. You know, so I guess it's you know, well, like I said earlier, track records one of them. So going and having a look at other projects that those, that developers done. Mm. Um, so that, I think that's probably one of the most important pieces of due diligence that someone could do. Have a look at you know, are that you sort of. How do they find that? Because I mean, because so, that that's actually. Well, I guess you have to do like some of the research yeah. that you need to yeah. sort of get on the websites and have a look at some of their completed projects, or. Um, so we, I mean, we do it in my ask business. Ask the people that are doing the sales. So, what other projects has this developer mm. done? I want to go and have a look yeah. at them, and what information can you give me about those? And it's really consumer protection, right? At the moment, the really consumer not. protection is you know very very little, and mm. on purpose, you know, the state government, um, the federal government, the local government. The you know the industry the construction industry is a huge part of our economy. Um, no one really wants to mm. change that, and so you know there has been a relaxing of regulation around yeah. it all, which gets it through and you get the products through. But you know we've kind of figured out. So the way I'm personally, I think the best way to change this is mm. you lift consumer protection. Yeah. You force developers to be more much more accountable to their defects. Yeah. Um, and if they get pain from it and they have to you know, remediate that pain, they're going to be a bit more careful when they build the building, aren't they? That's a good point, yeah. You know, you've so got to, yeah. commercially you've got to force to them to, to do yeah. it. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. But at the moment they haven't. So I guess it's just the risk is that people buying these buildings that have already been built, mm-hmm. um, that haven't gone through the same rigorous process, haven't got the same. you just got to be careful buying these because they you do. they'll yeah. change in the future, but maybe not soon enough. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Chris, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. I guess it's we've sort of probably spoken about our dumbo during the course of the the podcast, but it was really around we we hear a lot from people about making that commitment to an off the plan dwelling and make, committing such a huge financial decision to not to chance, but you know to you know to sort of on a sight unseen basis is pretty hardcore actually. Mm. So it's sort of saying, well, you know, maybe you know there'd be some sort of different and alternative ways to do that. So, so it's our the person dumbo that would signs be, up to yeah. the contract without. Just walking down the street. Yeah, it's just crazy. And then they go know. into an office, yeah. they get sold a you know, a house yeah. or an apartment yeah. and yeah. they sign a million dollar contract that's their for five hundred thousand. It is there quite amazing, yeah. isn't yeah. it? It's so, yeah. yeah. It's good it's, advice. I mean it's it's because that's if you know, the whole idea of selling these things is to mm. try to well, it wouldn't make a business unless you sold it. So mm. yeah. you know, you have to pro, you have to, the whole idea of selling it is actually hoping those people walk in the door. So um, yeah. You know, that's the whole development Selling industry is built dream. on that. So. Selling the dream. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate your time, Chris. Thank good you. Good one. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Yeah, great, in, great insights. Chat. And, um, you know, so obviously some insights from your background in the whole development space. Um, funnily enough, the geologist 
bit, we should have <laughs> talked a bit more about that because you know what's underneath is very yeah, important. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So. What's underneath the building. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the assembly model is, is a really interesting concept and, mm. um, you know, I shall, be, well, we'll watch with interest and yeah. love to do a follow-up interview with you once you actually do have some runs on the boards and, and see if the theories are playing yeah. out with the actualities and, and some of the learnings would be fantastic to hear about that. I'd yeah, I mean, to I, come back. yeah I mean, that's the thing. I, I actually, what I love about this topic is that, um, you know, we, we do have, we can't just, you know, say that we can't keep building things because we want to keep growing our population. We've got to keep yeah, building. Yeah, you've got a house somewhere. And so I think the opportunity now is to build the right stuff and actually get good community mm. outcomes. Mm. And, you know, you're one option. There's other ones like Nightingale and there's other ones popping up and there mm. will be more. Um, well, the more co, the better, really. Co-living, you know, Ed Co-living, Co-living, living, you know. Him yeah. a few, um, yeah. few episodes so, back, yeah. yeah. So the mm. more of these things that come out, we need to support them because um, you know, that's what's going to create the future of housing. 100%. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We want to make you a better elephant rider, and this week's elephant rider training is... Oh, Chris, you know how you and I, we keep telling people don't buy off the plan. But the fact is that some people are going to buy off the plan. So I just thought we could maybe touch on a few things that if you are hell-bent on doing it, that you should check out. Now, and I'll tell it in the guise of a story. How's that a bit different? Mm -hmm. So some years ago, my parents actually came to me and said, we want to buy this apartment off the plan. Um, And I was like... No, this is back in 2012. No, I said my mind set against it and they were set for it. So I said, okay, if you're going to do it, let me go and investigate. Now they had friends that already bought in this building. So that's one of the reasons they wanted to buy in there. So I went and, and went to the developer suite, which was the in the real estate agent's office and, you know, looked at the layouts and the floor plans and took, um, you know, took away a whole bunch of material. But the thing was he gave me his brochure. And the brochure had various floor plans in there for various apartment layouts and all the rest of it. And I said, right, can I look at the actual building plans, the site plans? And he looked at me like, what? No one's ever asked for that. And I said, well, I would like to see it. So what I got was a full set of architectural plans Mm. for the whole complex. Now, why was this useful? For lots of reasons. Because the particular apartment that my parents had decided they wanted to buy when I looked at the actual site plans, I could see that the garbage bin room was not too far away from their balcony. And I was like, that's interesting because, you know, we, A, you don't want to choose that apartment. But you know what? When you think about all the nice brochure, you, you don't ever see the garbage bin room marked on the renders. <laughs> really, do you? Right? So I went, well, there you go. That's interesting So because I got the full set of plans. So mm-hmm. you can't ask for that and they may or may not give it to you, but they gave it to me. So that was useful. So then I went back to the, the actual plans, the sale plans, and said, right, well, you don't want to buy that apartment. You want to buy one that maybe has the same aspect, the same layout, um, but is not located pretty much directly above the garbage bin room. So that's number one. That's number one tip. You mm-hmm. look, ask for more information. Um. The other thing that I did do, I actually went out and to the site and because I could walk around the site, obviously you can't walk onto a building site, but you can certainly pace around it. Now, once again, you know, this wasn't a huge complex. I mean, if you're in a massive, massive complex, you're not going to be able to do this. This is quite contained. So I literally could walk on the front street and the back street. So once again, I could pace out where the driveway was going to go in as well and I could pace out because my pace is pretty much one stride per metre. <laughs> so I could pace out literally and look up into the sort of sky and imagine exactly where various apartments were going to be mm. according to the plan. So you do have to go to that level of detail mm-hmm. to start to try to get a, a fuller understanding of exactly what it is you're buying. Mm-hmm. So they're just two things that I thought I could add into the, the conversation here, that if somebody's hell-bent on buying off the plan, they won't be doing... Uh, the Dumbo, uh, as mentioned in this earlier in this episode, of just buying sight unseen, walking into a, a you know, what do you call it, a sales suite. Um, actually, my parents didn't buy it in the end anyway, so th- there is another Dumbo in this episode. <laughs> I shouldn't make my parents be a Dumbo, but my parents weren't paying me for my advice, mm-hmm. and when I finally gave them some advice on this particular property, they didn't take it. Mm. 
Well, they did. They didn't buy it, I guess. No, I originally said no, but right. for this particular one, I did research the, the developer and the builder, okay. and they actually had a really good track record. Right. And interestingly enough, the particular building, I now drive past it every time I go and visit my parents. So it's seven years ago. It's now been up out of the ground for probably oh, five and a half, six years. Mm. Um, they now can't afford to buy that same apartment mm. because performed it performed well. And... As it turned out, the market moved really well. Actually, everything would have moved in their favour. The, mm. the timing was perfect just before the boom. Their, they would have had a good 18 months to sell their property. Um, their property would have gone up more than we anticipated. Like, actually, if they'd done it, it would have been a really good outcome for them. Mm. And then some years later, they came to me and said, oh, you know, my friends, they loved the building. They actually really enjoy living in there. Mm. The... Um, Another one had come up on the market, and that's when and when it sold when it came on the market. I said, "You can't afford it. You know that your home has actually not performed as well as those apartments." Oh, so they did buy something else, but that the- no, no, no. The house that they've still got, oh, the okay. original house, right, had not gone up in value. Yeah. At the same rate as the yeah. brand new apartment, so that that is an exception to our rule. Yeah, <laughs> but it would have actually been a good outcome for them. But I had done a lot of research before I changed my mind in my initial recommendation. It'd be interesting to look at the research as well. That if they didn't buy that new apartment, they bought an existing property for the same price in a similar area, mm. um, like an older apartment on a good street and a good block that was probably selling for the same price. Has that apartment worth more than the new apartment? Because that's really the the problem. The problem with off the plan is that people then don't compare what they could have done with that money at the same point in time. And I and I researched actually back then. I actually looked at established properties in order to Mm. establish the price. And there was obviously a premium for being brand new. But the one thing that these apartments have that none of those property properties had was actually some city views. And so actually that was the uniqueness that sort of made that worthwhile. But only some apartments in that block Actually, have that, the city views. Uh, yeah, over a certain level. But so. uh, more than half of them, though. But, I mean, on mm. the other side, the building's around or it's a square. No, no, it's, just a, it's, it's actually a building where all the apartments are orientated one direction. Ah, okay. Mm. So those, those, you know, and that's, a, that's the thing with these buildings is that not many builders build them that way. They no. have the core and then they build all the way around yeah. the core. And so maybe 60%, 70% of the apartments generally could be south-facing yeah. or haven't got the view or, a, you know, a low floors, haven't got the light, et cetera, like that. So, you know, in those apartment buildings, you know, there's only a certain portion that have got all the boxes ticked. It's true. And, in fact, even in this one, I really went through every single floor plan with a fine tooth comb mm. to really come down to what the – the optimum floor plans were and the optimum aspects. So even though they all face the same way, they had still have balconies on different sides mm-hmm. and they were sort of some of them got um, eastern morning sun and some of them got western afternoon mm-hmm. sun. So we had that whole conversation about what, what's your preference, you know, in terms of daylight. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. The generally in the building, though, yes, when you don't have everything facing the same way, mm-hmm. then then you do have, you know, you've got better apartments and worse apartments and, you know, there's there's usually a very small handful of, of the ideal apartments in any block like that. And that's the other problem is that those buildings, the ones that the good ones are for sale, either have been sold already, developers sold them to their mates, they've kept them in their own little pocket, <laughs> uh, and only what you can buy as an investor are all the stuff that no one else really wants because the reality <laughs> is it's not like it all goes on sale at the right same time. A lot of it's pre-sold. All the good stuff's taken away and what's left for the, the punters on the street is usually the poorer assets. So I think it's um, if you are buying these off-the-plan developments, how do you actually get the best ones in the block? We well, definitely don't want to you buy the last do it. one. No, exactly. You definitely do not want to be buying the last one, that's for but sure. But even if you're buying the last 70%, you still might be buying all the poor ones in the block. Although I tell you what, a lot of investors I don't think think that – Deeply about it, no. Well, you know, of so not. therefore you might snaffle something. <laughs> they got to sell them. Cool. So there you go. Cautionary tale. Turns of my parents not taking my advice. They'll never listen to this podcast. They don't even yeah. have a. Um, I don't even think they've got a smartphone. So yeah. I think we're safe. <laughs> 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 Thank okay. You. Please join us for our next episode when we interview a property stylist and interior designer. Amy Stead. She's also got a really great real estate background. So her insights into, oh, things like lipstick on a pig, you know, when you're renovating a property or you're flipping things to look for as buyers in terms of what little tricks do stylists do to make properties look bigger and lighter. Loads of absolutely really practical hints in this episode. Great chat. Please join us. Don't forget we're on all the socials.
social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.